Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our next uh, Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. And it is certainly my pleasure to, today to, inter, uh, to introduce our speaker, who is world-renowned, actually yeah, has been uh, a leader in the area of environmental health and uh, has been one of the most innovative people that, we've, that I've ever run across in this area. And uh, it's Dr. Aruni Batnagar. He's currently the Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division of Environmental Medicine and he's my vice chair for uh, research concerns, as well as being the Smith and Lucille Gibson Professor of Medicine and the director of the Christina Lee Brown Environ Environment Institute uh, and the American Heart Association Tobacco Regulation Center. Uh, he's a distinguished scholar of, of the university and uh, here at the University School of Medicine. And he is uh, has a background uh, that uh, is international, of course, he actually, uh, uh, comes from uh, Lucknow, India, and he's been here at at uh, Louisville for quite a while after being in Galveston, Texas, uh, where he trained and became an academician in terms of being an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Human Biological Chemistry, Genetics, and, and the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. Uh, he worked his way up to full professor uh, when he transferred here uh, to come into the D Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. Uh, and he is has been uh, of uh, territories, a variety of territories, including uh, cardiovascular medicine, uh, and uh, the he's been the director of the Diabetes and Obesity Center, and he has been a professor in the School of Public Health as well as the Department of Medicine. And without further ado, I should introduce him to really uh, uh, tell us about environmental determinants of cardiovascular disease really continuing our efforts to try and focus on health equity and the kinds of things uh, that he's been doing to try to help um, right the, the difficulties that we've had um, and, and with the environmental impact on our communities. Dr. Batnagar? Well, Dr. Williams, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It, it, it seems like I've been here for a very long time. Let me just start my, uh, my shift thing. Yeah. Okay. There Can you go. see it now? Yes. Okay. So um, good morning, everyone. What I want to do today is to talk to you about environmental determinants of cardiovascular health. And uh, in, the, in the overall context, to make a convincing case that much of cardiovascular disease is actually derived from the environment. And then sort of after a general introduction of what the environment means or what I mean by the environment, and we, I will present to you a unique study that we are doing. So as we all know that there, that heart disease is the leading cause of death, and it's been the leading cause of death for many, many years from 1900 to now, except at the time of Spanish flu. And even now with COVID, I think it still is a major killer. And it is comes in a variety of forms, but it most importantly, it is coronary artery disease that accounts for most of cardiovascular deaths. And so that's the most common, what we call the garden variety uh, cardiovascular disease. It's not so much that the disease has been uh, the major killer, but over the last few years, we've seen large swings in the incidence of cardiovascular disease. We know from the 60s that the rates of heart disease have come down, but now they're beginning to increase again. And we see this worldwide that there is an increase in the incidence and mortality of cardiovascular disease. And despite all the different advances we've made in the treatment uh, as both surgical and medical treatment, that we see the rates of disease are increasing. And the American Heart Association uh, estimates that by 2030, nearly 40% of all adults in the United States would be living with some form of heart disease. So how is it that this disease keeps changing so much? It is certainly, there are two causes, could be genetic and could be environmental, but that, that the disease rates change over time in different places makes a strong case that maybe much of the disease is environmental rather than genetic. So what evidence there might be about how there would be a change in the rates of heart disease uh, because of the change in geography? So there are several examples I can cite. One of the examples is that it is uh, that it is actually uh, uh, going there, moving from one place to the other place can actually increase the risk of the disease. 
Uh, and we know that from a variety of different studies, one of that could be the studies that were done in the early 70s when people moved from Japan to Hawaii and they could see that there was a rise in the incidence of stroke and heart disease. Uh, similarly, we've seen decreases. So there is something called the Finnish miracle. In Finland, when they joined the EU and they had uh, access to fresh fruits and vegetables all year round, that the rates of heart disease plummeted and you can see there was a dramatic decrease in the rates of heart disease. On the converse, we see that the, the heart disease rates can also increase. And uh, this is an example from China during opening up of China and westernization, we see that there was a 50% increase in uh, cardiovascular deaths. So if a, the rates of a disease and, and can decrease or increase so dramatically with change in environmental conditions, suddenly there is a, a not a strong case to say that much of this could be environment could be genetic. Um, so when we see increases, we could we could say that maybe there are environmental changes rather than you know drastic genetic changes that may be underlying uh, this rise in disease that we see. So. Um, we not only in, in places like far away places like China, and so we see rises in the disease in many different parts of the, of the world, uh, particularly also in the United States. And that's really alarming, as you can see in the map, even places like, like Kentucky and, uh, have seen an increase in the rates of heart disease over the last decade. So overall, if we estimate nearly 60 to 80% of cardiovascular disease is uh, because of environmental causes and therefore preventable. So if there was a way to understand the disease, we need to look at not only the environment, but also the genetics, but those things are part of the same puzzle. And so although we have devoted much time with the Human Genome Project and ongoing precision medicine, um, the sort of initiatives, we do see that there has been less attention to what is happening with the environment and what role the environment plays in uh, determining the the incidence and the risk of the disease and as well as its severity. So how do we understand a human environment? The human environment is very complex. It is maybe, uh, it could be thought of as being made up of different domains. And there is of course uh, the natural domain which is the most primordial domain that we are in. And then there is the social environment which is always nested within the natural environment. And that plays an important role uh, in the, determining the incidence and the severity of the disease. And then there is also the personal environment, which is uh, again nested within the social environment. And these are the environments that we create by chance or circumstance or by choice. Uh, and those elements of those environment uh, play an important role in determining our disease risk. But overall, I submit that cardiovascular disease is an environmental disease. And so we should look at the environment and different components of the environment to be able to attribute causes of this disease to various specific environmental factors, because only then we can develop some actionable items. So what are these domains of the environment and how could they contribute to the risk of disease? So let's look at the natural environment first. There are many components of the natural environment. The, uh, there's a geosphere and biosphere, and we know all of these and we will go through them a little bit uh, in further detail, have a strong bearing on our health and longevity. And so we evolve within the natural world and no matter how much we try, we are always going to be sort of within this domain. And so what would happen is that if we sort of disregard our natural origins and think that we live in an artificial world devoid of any natural influences, then that creates a stress and a tension and increases the risk of many diseases, including cardiovascular disease. So one of the primordial elements of the natural environments are the cycles of night and day. And all life is entrained to this cycle so that we have genes uh, in, within, uh, our, uh, within individual cells that oscillate and a 24 hour rhythm, we have a central clock that regulates all these genes and therefore it keeps us tethered to the natural environment on a daily basis. And if we sort of thought these uh, links and try to um, sort of stretch the limits, then we have to pay a cost, which is in terms of increased disease risk. So uh, particularly cardiovascular disease. And here's one example of a study from the Netherlands where they compared 
individuals with normal sleep duration and good sleep quality to those with short sleep duration and poor subjective sleep. And those with poor sleep have a much higher incidence of overall cardiovascular disease as well as coronary artery disease. So you, not only just the actual outcomes, but many risk factors of cardiovascular disease are actually influenced by sleep. For example, sleep has a very strong effect on blood pressure. In healthy adults, the systolic and diastolic blood pressures increase when they're very sleep deprived. And only a few days of sleep deprivation can uh, upset or alter blood pressure regulation. And if you have a chronic sleep duration, which is short, then it is increased, there is increased prevalence of hypertension and, uh, and higher blood pressures. So not only uh, blood pressure, but also obesity, there is actually good evidence, and this is a meta-analysis showing that there is good evidence that those who have good sleep quality have a uh, much lower risk of obesity, whereas those with poor sleep quality have a higher risk of actually uh, having uh, um, sort of obesity and obesity related syndromes. Not only do healthy adults, but also individuals with cardiovascular disease are uh, very susceptible to changes in sleep duration. Uh, sleep duration in after a few months with ST elevation MI is an independent predictor of all cause mortality. And you could see that the odds ratio is, is, is enormously high. So uh, managing sleep in patients with MI could be an objective clinical goal, and therefore it could uh, be an object of actually therapeutic intervention, or at least a lifestyle intervention. But such sleep deprivation does not affect all individuals equally. Those who have cardio cardiovascular disease are much more sensitive, but we also know from studies that there are sort of ethnic and racial disparities, uh, perhaps because they were, they're used to a different life cycle, an equatorial background, the African-Americans are more likely than uh, non-Black uh, Americans to have insomnia, to have sleep apnea, and to have daytime sleepiness. And in addition, they spend uh, less time in deep sleep uh, in comparison with uh, non-Black populations. So therefore, we need to be cognizant of not only the importance of sleep, uh, but also um, sort of these individual and group variations in sleep. In addition to the cycles of, of night and day that regulate our physiology, there are also the rhythms of the season. And we know that in, uh, from several studies that cardiovascular mortality is the lowest in summer, and that we can see that if you look at cardiovascular mortality, that it always increases in the winter. And, but surprisingly, this data are from Los Angeles where you know there is no sort of winter to, to speak of, you can still see that a much greater rise uh, in deaths during the winter months. So suddenly it's not the, the temperature, it's not that people are indoors in winter and they get recurrent flus and so on, and therefore, which precipitates cardiovascular death, but maybe there is something more intrinsic, more fundamental about summer and winter that makes a difference. And so one particular factor that could differ between summer and winter is the sunlight. And as you know, sunlight is an important uh, determinant of health. We tend to forget, but we are like plants. We photosynthesize vitamin D from the sunlight. And so uh, sufficient exposure to sunlight is an important uh, sort of determinant of uh, a variety of different processes. And these would involve not only regulation of circadian rhythms and vitamin D synthesis, but also blood pressure regulation. And uh, there are uh, there is a very large literature showing that individuals who are uh, recurrently exposed to sunlight actually have greater longevity and live longer um, and have lower risk of cardiovascular disease than those who actually have less exposure to the sun. In addition to the, the sunlight and day and night cycles, we are also sensitive to the actual latitude uh, and the places where we live. For example, many studies have shown that there is an increase in blood pressure as well as the prevalence of hypertension as you move away from the equator. And this uh, phenomena is observable both going uh, north of the equator or going south of the equator. So that we would know that, that there is actually uh, a geographic variation in blood pressure and hypertension risk. 
In addition to, to these sort of geographic factors, there's also the biologic factors such as greenness, and we talk about that later in a little bit, but um, there is a, a, a sort of extensive evidence that those who live close to green spaces have a decreased rate of cardiovascular mortality. Um, in addition to that, we also have evidence that there are changes in the incidence of cardiovascular disease because of altitude. People who live in, low, in higher altitudes are actually uh, much, have much lower rates of heart disease. We do not know what the reason uh, that is. Maybe there are lower levels of air pollution, maybe the oxygen levels are different. Maybe there are other factors that contribute to this sort of salutary effects of altitude on human health. But we see in selective populations that these effects are actually ones that have caused people to adapt. So people who live in high altitude become more resistant to cardiovascular disease because of, uh, of their ancestry and because of adaptation. So two examples of that. First is the people from Tibet. People from Tibet live in a very high area with an average uh, height of about 10,000 feet. And they have been living there for at least 20 to 30,000 years. So uh, they have adapted to the atmosphere with low oxygen. They have lower pulmonary pressures. They have better cardiac output. They have uh, you know, a much greater capacity to carry oxygen in their blood because of mutation in the hemoglobin. And so therefore they have rare um, incidence of, of hypertension and heart disease. So certainly um, our adaptation to how we handle oxygen or respond to it is an important determinant of cardiovascular disease as well as blood pressure. We also see similar changes in the Andean Indians, although they have been living in the Andes mountains for a lesser amount of time than the Tibetans have been living in the Himalayas, maybe about 20,000 years, 25,000 years. And we can see in most of the Andean population that there is muscularization of pulmonary arteries. There is a, a somewhat of a right ventricular hypertrophy because of living in low at, uh, oxygen concentrations, but they have compensated with a very elaborate coronary structure. And so they have a much more diffuse coronary architecture, which allows them to uh, live at high altitudes and low oxygen concentrations, but it also diminishes the risk of cardiovascular disease. We also see a similar pattern in Switzerland where people have been living at high altitudes for a long time. And as you can see that for every 100 meter increase in the uh, height, there is about a 12% decrease in the risk of uh, all-cause mortality. And then even if you move from a higher altitude to a lower altitude, that you preserve this benefit. And so therefore there's something about um, high altitude that's that's protective and maybe uh, maybe it's has to do with oxygen or sunlight or other factors and that remains to be worked out. But what it does tell us is that with all these aspects of features of the natural environment that our well-being and health is tethered to the natural world and that uh, living it is sort of in association and synchrony with the natural conditions is conducive to health and and or conversely those who do not live in, uh, in synchrony and harmony with the nature of natural world have a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. But we don't all live in the natural world all the time. We, as I said, we have created social worlds around ourselves, which are nested within the natural world. And we spend most of our time living in these uh, social structures. And those structures have a strong bearing and, and affect our health more than we actually um, know or admit. The social networks and the social environment is very complex and has a variety of features that have been a cause of much study. It's, for example, the culture, history, you know, our technology, um, our built environment. All of these actually uh, not only alter the world that we live in, but are actually a very bodies and a very susceptibility to disease. And so, when we um, have we and try to understand the origins of chronic disease, particularly heart disease we have to understand what sort of social structures people are living in so that we can identify the true origins or the roots of, of the uh, of specific diseases. Um, we, we know that there are uh, sort of a strong bearing of the socioeconomic status on people's health and well-being. And this sort of uh, gives rise to a general understanding that people who are, have a much optimistic, much better view of life uh, much better uh, value the life more, have a greater purpose in life, uh, have much better health 
and much lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, the specific data came was presented many years ago, and this is uh, from the Bell Labs, and it was showing that people with higher levels of education have um, much lower mortality, and that income is one of the strongest determinants. And there may be lots of reasons for that, access to healthcare and so on, but there are other more subtle factors, uh, the sense of control, uh, a way of, of having uh, more control over your life and over your surroundings, uh, just that uh, sort of way of uh, behaving can actually de diminish the risk of chronic diseases, particularly heart disease. Uh, but we don't live as individuals, live as part of social networks. And these social networks are also uh, very powerfully shape our health and well-being. And one study here is this is from a group in Yale showing that there is a spread of disease occurs to social networks. As you can see that these are people who actually um, congregate together. So they're clusters and people who form clusters have or are friends or families or neighbors. When they live together or form a cluster, a social cluster, then the disease risk is in part determined by the social clusters. So if you are around friends who are obese and have poor eating habits, you tend to develop poor eating habits. If you're around uh, friends who have much better uh, eating habits and who have much healthier uh, ways of living, then you adapt to that. So we are very sensitive to our social surroundings and our social networks and our risk factors for disease are actually uh, permeated through different social organization and social clusters. But apart from actual social interaction with other people, the actual makeup of our environment, the built environment makes a big difference as well. And we can see that uh, factors such as uh, the place that we live, the proximity to roads, roadways, traffic and noise, all of that make a huge difference in our cardiovascular disease risk and in the risk of chronic disease in particular. Um, here, this one example in which they looked at different neighborhoods. And as you can see, that people who live in, in less advantaged neighborhoods, and this is like the series three shown here, um, even with the same income group, <clears throat> have a much uh, higher incidence of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so there is personal income that makes a difference. So you know that people with higher income um, have much lower risk. But people who live in disadvantaged groups have a much higher uh, risk of, of mortality, even though they are from the same income group. So here you can see group one is one which is an advantage group. Uh, and, uh, this is a disadvantaged group. It's a much higher incidence where the people with advantage groups have much lower risk of heart disease. But that in addition to the built environment, we also have the problem that we grapple with neighborhoods, especially urban neighborhoods, is air pollution. And in fact, 150,000 premature deaths per year in the United States could be attributed to air pollution. And uh, there are 7 million premature deaths worldwide could be attributed to air, air pollution. We know that uh, we are exposed to a variety of pollutants, but cardiovascular disease is the major outcome of exposure to adverse environmental conditions. And this uh, total burden exceeds that due to injuries of cancer or respiratory disease. So air pollution or air pollution in general has a much higher impact on cardiovascular health than it has on, on other forms, um, other types of diseases. But the air pollution we know is not only is a current problem, it's increasing. We know that the carbon dioxide levels are increasing worldwide and that we uh, have seen an increase in the levels of greenhouse gases. And this, these changes are going to continue because of climate change. Um, every year for the last 30 years, we have seen that the climate of the earth has consistently exceeded the bounds of natural variability. And so unless we understand, contain, and address these issues of climate health, we will see an increasing cost on, uh, on health, particularly on cardiovascular health. So one of the main components uh, from air, uh, from in air pollution is what we call PM or particulate matter. And this is derived from a number of different sources, uh, forest fires, um, industrial sources, traffic, and so on. So we were in, interested in studying how this would affect um, sort of healthy individuals. So we did a study, this was in uh, Utah, where in the valley you could get these uh, weather inversions, and these weather inversions can actually 
lead to a high levels of PM and from low, from low levels of PM, you can go to very high levels and that these things uh, sort of can be episodic. And we saw that whenever you have high levels of PM that there is a decrease in the levels of these angiogenic cells which promote uh, the, the repair and growth of blood vessels and indicating that uh, even a short duration exposure to air pollution can um, lead to a risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. But these were studies in humans and there could be many variables. So we came back to the lab and we set up here uh, at UofL this elaborate inhalation facility where we can expose mice to air pollutants and to filtered air and then compare. And we saw the same things that we saw in humans that there's a decrease in the levels of these angiogenic cells when their mice are exposed to concentrated air pollution. Where we see a similar things also in Louisville in people where we look at people who, look, who live in different parts of the town. And here you can see that we, we uh, sort of sample people from all over the, the county and people who lived in uh, areas that have closer proximity to roadways would actually show lower levels of these, uh, of these angiogenic cells, uh, sort of suggesting again that roadway proximity could increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. But we also see a variety of changes in different uh, mediators for uh, inflammatory markers, particularly those that are anti-angiogenic are actually increased, whereas the, the pro-angiogenic ones uh, such as VEGF and so on are decreased. So it means that when we are exposed to air pollution that there is a change in the inflammatory profile and then that could lead to um, greater risk of cardiovascular disease by interfering with, uh, with the repair of blood vessels and with uh, a greater risk of, uh, of sort of cardiovascular dysfunction. So what can we do about that? I mean, we know there is a lot of air pollution. We know that with climate change, uh, these uh, conditions are going to worsen, but is it, are there solutions to this problem? So in searching for the, such solutions, we launched a program called the Green Heart Project. And so uh, this project is to actually understand whether or not greenness affects the risk of cardiovascular disease. As I was um, uh, describing before, uh, we have tried all we could. We have uh, one of the best treatments for cardiovascular disease. We have stents, we have statins, we have great management, but the incidence of the disease keeps rising. So the answer is not really uh, better and better care, but more efficient uh, prevention. So if um, we are um, trying to prevent cardiovascular disease, and if we know that cardiovascular disease is in part derived from the environment, uh, and part of that could be due to air pollution and lack of uh, green exposure, then maybe we need to figure out ways of how to enhance that and whether or not that could be a quantifiable uh, way in which we can prevent uh, or actually diminish the risk of cardiovascular disease. We know from previous studies and there's very large studies from many different countries showing that people who live in low greens areas have twice the cardiovascular mortality, showing that there is actually an association between the levels of greenness and your risk of cardiovascular disease. But these are just this association. Uh, a sort of interesting study which sort of looked at longitudinal effects was what done here in the United States where uh, they found that because of the loss of trees and this is uh, the loss of trees was due to the infestation of the uh, borer beetle. And this borer, this beetle affects only the ash trees in the United States and it has, actually killed several million trees as it has migrated from north to the south. So whenever we, we, there was uh, an increase in the infestation and, and as the trees uh, kept dying and the canopy of different cities kept decreasing, there was an increase in the incidence of cardiovascular disease. So suggesting that uh, in places where trees and greenness diminishes and, and shrubs and trees die, in the people in the community die as well. So there is this link between greenness and health that is in reinforced by such studies. Not only that, there is also studies showing that once you have cardiovascular disease, then recovery from that may be affected by exposure to green spaces. And this study showing uh, shows that people who live in areas of high greenness have uh, better survival after stroke, uh, suggesting that there is something in these um, what we could call green environments and recuperative places that um, 
increases survivability of people undergoing major traumatic interest, uh, in, insults. And we see similar things, not only for cardiovascular disease, but for cancer as well. And this was a study we recently completed. And what we found was that in these place, in places, and these are different states that we are looking at cancer registries. And we wanted to look at the survivability after cancer and whether green spaces would affect survivability. And this is a cohort over 5 million people and 2 million deaths. And as you can see that at least for high survivability cancer, the things like um, breast cancer and so on, there was a much strong influence of greenness. NDVI here is a measure of greenness in that area. So air people who are living after cancer diagnosis in more green areas tend to survive better than people who live in less green areas. So that how does uh, uh, these green areas prevent or uh, decrease the degree of the risk of the disease. Maybe it's air pollution, maybe there are other things that are contributing to it. But certainly some components of air pollution may be important. So we, we were doing the study in, again, in, in Jefferson County, looking at people living all across um, the city and, its, and the neighborhoods. And we wanted to see whether there was an association between the extent of greenness in their neighborhood with the amount of exposure to these volatile organic compounds that we're studying. And these are things like benzene and xylene and toluene. And these are a whole range of metabolites of these um, VOCs in the urine. And as you see, several of them are much lower in places which are more green. Uh, and this is because uh, of, we, we suppose, because of the um, ability of green spaces to decrease uh, exposure to these uh, pollutant gases. And we see this association not only with the peak greenness, but also with sort of free canopy, with the amount of street trees that you have, although the association is much weaker. The, so having a, a residential proximity to green spaces makes a difference in your exposure to these chemicals. And this seems to be depending upon, depends upon greenness close to your homes. and so. This is a, a graph showing that how far away from someone's house would greenness have the maximum effect. So we drew red, these circles or concentric circles around people's homes. And we found that within a, if there was greenness between 100 to 200 meters of people's houses, that seems to have a maximum effect, which seems to dissipate when uh, we go further away. So it's not so much that greenness distant from your house that makes a difference, but greenness that is very proximal to where you live. So people who live in high green areas have a lower exposure to these uh, chemicals and people who live in low green areas have much higher exposures. And, and so we see these changes, not only in the effects of, uh, or not in total um, exposure, but also in the effects of air pollution. So this is one study showing that uh, measuring arterial stiffness. And these are all different um, indices of arterial stiffness. And, and some of them show a drastic decrease in people who are living in green spaces. So we do see an increase of arterial stiffness with air pollution, but when people live in green spaces, the effects of air pollution are attenuated because of the surrounding greenness. We also see that greenness could not only just uh, decrease the, the levels of uh, pollutant exposure, but it could actually enhance resilience. And uh, for, for one, we wanted to look at what happens to, to the stress hormones on people who live near green spaces. And for that, we measure the levels of epinephrine, which you know is uh, a marker of the sympathetic activation. And we see uh, a sort of a, a dose dependent decrease in the urinary levels of epinephrine as the levels of greenness increases in, in their neighborhood. So certainly people living in green spaces can uh, are, have reported lower rates of anxiety and depression. And we see that we can actually biochemically measure the uh, lower sympathetic activation in people living in more green areas. So there may be a variety of different ways in which green spaces can make a change, can affect differences, and can uh, have salutary effects on health. 
Uh, there could be uh, you know, decreases in exposure to pollutants of different type, maybe just air pollution, but also night and noise. Uh, maybe there's greater walkability that people are healthier in greener neighborhoods because they tend to be more outside, uh, they, they partake in physical activity and so on. But there may be other uh, reasons by which greenness could actually have a major impact on the health and disease risk of an individual and it can create healthy neighborhoods. So there've been a variety of sort of different um, views and why trees could be helpful to neighborhoods. Um, they could absorb pollution, they could improve neighborhood quality, they can reduce your actual um, exposure to, to different types of chemicals and so on. But in addition, you know, there could be other beneficial effects such as preventing storm water runoff or reducing the need for uh, air conditioning and heating. So all of these sort of views have been formulated on the basis of um, associative evidence that we find people living in green spaces do better and the greener neighborhoods are healthier, but there are a variety of other reasons which we cannot rule out. There are these sort of uh, pesky unaccounted for variables that we may not have taken into account. And so what we need to do is to look at as a good clinical study in a controlled clinical trial, whether increasing greenness in a neighborhood make a difference. So that would be a better and a stronger and more robust evidence than just looking at associations between greenness and health. So that's what the, where the Green Heart Project was initiated. And, and what this project is, is a quite a unique project because it involves partnership with a, uh, a very different range of partners. Of course, uh, we have people from the University of Louisville uh, and by the different universities, but we watch you, we have uh, people from Cornell, but we also have uh, support from the National Institutes of Health, the US Forest Services, uh, and from the Hyper Design Labs who participated in designing the greenness buffers uh, in this, uh, for the study. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the active participation and support of the um, city of Louisville. So a central hypothesis in this um, study was that exposure to green uh, neighborhood greenery uh, would decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease by reducing the levels of air pollution. So for this, uh, what, what we decided to do was to go to a neighborhood. And within the neighborhood, we identified a cluster of houses or cluster of, of, of uh, community clusters in which we would uh, put uh, trees and plants, and then we would compare them to an adjacent neighborhood where we do not put uh, increased greenness. So we are trying to compare between two neighborhoods uh, adjacent to each other. So this is like a controlled trial. And then we only uh, intervene in one part of the neighborhood. Uh, and instead of just like a regular um, sort of drug trial, instead of giving drugs, we are increasing greenness in the neighborhood. So in order to do that, we first did a survey of the neighborhood. We actually um, did a flyover and, and flew an airplane over the area to do a, a sort of visual scan, we call it hyperspectral scanning, so that we can know where each tree in the neighborhood was, how stressed the trees were, which trees could have need to be replaced, and where we do have places to plant new trees so that we have a good view of the, uh, the entire neighborhood. And, and then we did some air pollution measurements, which is satellite measurements to get uh, area level uh, changes in air pollution, as well as in um, as well as greenness. So we can do satellite imager, imagery to get levels of greenness. And then we did a sort of stationary monitoring. So we installed 60 different sites with air pollution monitors so that we can know the levels of air pollution throughout the neighborhood. We also did mobile monitoring. And as you can see here, we had a graduate student go drive around in a golf cart for over, when I, I think about 2,000 to 3,000 miles to map out the, the, the areas which have higher levels of air pollution. So this was done not only to get some baseline information, but also to guide our planting so that we could plant green trees in areas where there was larger levels of air pollution as opposed to places which had less levels of air pollution so that we can do targeted planting into the neighborhood. And so all of this sort of evaluation of the neighborhood and different types of places 
we could get a detailed map of where the levels of air pollution in the neighborhood uh, were. Um, one sort of interesting side note that we were looking at these areas of high pollution, most of the areas, several of the areas of high pollution were near major roads as expected, but we also found the high levels of air pollution near fast food restaurants, which is something which is not expected. And so uh, we think that maybe there are hot spots or areas where high levels of pollution congregate even within a residential neighborhood. And so we can focus our planting there. Uh, in addition to atmospheric variables and baseline variables, we also uh, looked at cardiovascular variables. We uh, enrolled almost uh, 500 to 600 people in our study to look at some baseline measures of cardiovascular function, blood pressure, lipids, obesity, and risk factors. We also looked at social cohesion, anxiety, and depression, a range of different parameters doing psychosocial evaluation and be able to understand how uh, you know, things like depression, anxiety, and so on change when, if you were going to change greenness in the neighborhood. And we also looked at um, social cohesion to see how neighborhood people were interacting with each other. <clears throat> and then uh, we planted large trees. And the thing with the project is that you cannot simply go and plant small saplings as done usually because by the time these trees grow, to be tall enough to make a significant measurable difference that it might take uh, many, many years to complete the project, you know, 20, 30 years. And so what we did was to be able to plant very large trees, as large as we can possibly get them. Some trees are 20, 30 foot trees. In fact, some of these root balls, and this is actually a smaller tree, some of the root balls actually in, are almost the size of a small car. And so the idea was to plant about 8,000 trees and shrubs within the neighborhood to make an appreciable difference in the tree canopy and in the greenness that surrounds these areas. And because there were high levels of air pollution from the roadways, we actually looked at the sidewalls, uh, these are the sound walls around the Waterson Freeway um, in this area, which is near Churchill Downs and south of the uh, airport. And on the freeway there, we have sound walls. And so we wanted to cover these sound walls. For that, we had to prepare the ground. We had to um, you know, de determine which species we we're going to put and where. Most of the plants that we are planting are evergreen because they have much higher levels of greenness all the way year round. And that there have been studies showing that uh, in comparison with deciduous trees, the evergreen trees absorb more particulate air pollution. So this was the condition of the wall um, before we started, and this is what we ended up with. So as you can see that we extensively greened the, the area, not only by putting large trees, but putting small shrubs and, and so on. And the reason for that is I was telling you that we didn't want the small trees, but the reason that we wanted to put a gradient across this, because if you put large trees next to roadways, uh, suppose you have a roadway and then you have these lollipop trees lining both sides of the roadway. These lollipop trees actually uh, trap air pollution at the, at the nose level and makes things worse. So just a simple idea that let's just put trees randomly doesn't work. It, there, there has to be a certain geometry which would gradually ease out air pollution from the roadway. And so that we could uh, facilitate the removal of particulate air pollution. And we've done this computer simulation models in which we see that if there is a highway and, and, the, and if you plant trees haphazardly, then you actually trap uh, more, more particles. So these are the black line is the no tree case. And then if you have a condition like this, we call the current condition, this is how trees are planted in some of the neighbor, uh, neighborhoods across the freeway, you actually make things worse and, and air pollution actually increases in the neighborhood. But if you plant trees in a certain manner from going from low to low height to a much greater height, then in the design case, you can see that you, may, you expect to remove more air pollution rather than make things worse. So it's not only um, the placement, the species, the geometry, um, but also the entire architecture of the barrier that makes a, a big difference on how much uh, pollution you might expect to remove. So what we were we are plan we were planning to do was to actually um, plant these trees in the roadside uh, buffers. 
We want to do neighborhood planting and uh, be able to provide shade trees, but so evergreen trees to increase the levels of greenness in the neighborhood. And then we can model all of this so that we would know exactly the level of which that we have uh, made a difference. Uh, the idea again is to be able to gently remove all of these to be able to uh, prevent uh, the, these uh, different um, sort of effects or different air pollutants from getting into neighborhood. Then after four years, we think we were going to um, go back again and look at the, um, the, the changes in air pollution and as well as changes in the um, cardiovascular health in the community. To date, we have planted about 8,000 uh, trees uh, and these uh, we have almost completed our greenness. We have done a baseline evaluation and uh, one evaluation after the trees. And so we think that after some, um, you know, four years, we could go back uh, and be able to reevaluate what our intervention has done. And again, we're going to compare the target area to the control area. And between these two areas, we might be able to discern a difference because of planting of trees uh, into the target area. Not only a difference in air pollution levels, but we're also measuring sound changes, temperature changes, uh, but, uh, but also changes in the health of the people, in their physical health, as well as in, the, in their mental health. So what, what do we expect to learn from doing all of this? We would expect to learn how to plant trees in urban locations to maximize the removal of air pollutants. We have several types of air pollution pollutants that are present in, uh, in neighborhoods. Um, some of these air pollutants are actually um, particulate air pollutions and some are uh, gaseous air pollutants. And so we want to be able to discern whether or not uh, we, are, we are removing each of these and to what extent and which type configuration and composition of the greening intervention is most effective in removing these barriers. We, of course, we want to look at uh, how neighborhood greenness affects the health of the people living there. Are there lower levels of anxiety and depression in that particular neighborhood? What happens to uh, the uh, social interaction of the people living there? What happens to their blood pressure levels, the risk of heart disease and other chronic diseases? Um, is there uh, an effect of trees only on the psychosocial effects or are there actual biological effects on people? There is a, a sort of a series of experiments that we're trying to do is that maybe trees put out actual um, chemicals which are, that uh, when we inhale have a soothing effect. There are all these different terpenes that uh, evergreens release, and there's been some evidence that inhaling these terpenes can lower heart rate variability, can lower blood pressure, and that might be one of the reasons that trees have such an important effect. The other part also is that trees could um, increase the biodiversity in the area, and we have a team of people looking at macrobiodiversity. We have a graduate student looking at bats and uh, butterflies and other microdiversity in the area, and then we have a group that's beginning to look at the microbiodiversity. So if you increase biodiversity in the area, you, you enhance the immune function of the people, make people more immune resilient, and maybe that's one of the reasons that trees might be helpful. But in addition to all this uh, sort of clinical, biological and, and uh, effects, there could be other social effects. The trees uh, could decrease crime rates, could alter property values, could change stormwater runoff and energy use and decrease the uh, the extent of temperature changes within the community. So we need to follow all of these carefully uh, to be able to understand how we, we, in, we change a community or one feature in a community and how it ripples effects uh, change everything else. So uh, there is a, a large team of people studying that and we hope that overall, you know, maybe we would understand how trees could help individuals increase the health of the neighborhoods, but most importantly, could increasing greenness in the neighborhood be an effective prevention uh, for cardiovascular disease, which I started with the, uh, with data and graphs showing that that is and remains a leading cause of death worldwide. So hopefully we learn something important that will change the way we live and the way we practice medicine. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Dr. Botnagar. Another outstanding presentation. We really do appreciate it. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Cook, I don't know if you if you want to start off with any with if you had any uh, question or comment to kind of get us started here in the end. I know we already do have a question in the uh, uh, from Dr. Emmons in the chat area, but Dr. Cook, would you count what you want to kind of uh, lead us off here? Yeah, let's just <clears throat> excuse me. Let's just go ahead to Dr. Emmons' question. So, Dr. Botnagar, are you able to to see the chat? Yes. Um, it says, do we know anything about the type of greenness that helps VOC compounds? Trees, type of other plants, do we have information about VOCs and heart disease in Brazil and the loss of rainforests and the large green space changes in the world since we can now engineer plants, understanding the biology would be important. Yes, we are in particular not botanists and arborists. And so we do not, we have not been studying the exact chemistry, but there is sufficient literature evidence suggests that VOCs uh, concentrations, at least the what we call anthropogenic VOCs could be decreased by trees. They can absorb these VOCs and metabolize them. But on the other hand, trees can actually generate their own types of VOCs and because of their reactions with other, uh, the, the type of chemicals and gases they emit can react and create more um, VOCs. Some of them are good, some of them are not so bad. So yes, there is evidence that uh, trees can remove VOCs. There is also some evidence that the rainforest can actually um, make an important difference, but those effects are most, mostly local. In fact, we had before the pandemic, we had planned a trip to Brazil and spend you know, a couple of weeks there trying to understand what uh, being in a for, uh, rainforest does to the health of an individual, to the blood pressure, heart rate, and so on. So I think it's an ongoing area of investigation and very important for us to understand, especially when we're making you know, new types of plants and trees. So thank you for that question. Thank you. If anyone else has a question, uh, feel free to speak up or put it in the chat. Um, and it looks like you have a question from Dr. Uh, Kruger. Yes, in your social evaluation include questions about pets and homes. Uh, yes, we do ask them about whether they have pets because there is a, a lot of evidence that pets, as you point out, um, they, have, they increase biodiversity in the house. Actually, the the whole uh, living condition has one central, what we call microbiome. So people who live together share the same microbiome, including pets. And, and so uh, there tends to be a higher level of uh, microbial diversity in, in houses that have pets, even children. If you have children in the house, they go in and out. So they, they change the composition of the biodiversity. So we are doing a sub-study in which we are measuring uh, how people wear this exposometer, uh, and in that they we record or deposit all the different types of um, biodiverse organisms that are mi microorganisms that are in the environment. And so we will be able to tell whether there are these differences or not. And these, these studies which are used in exposometer can actually look at 4,000 different species of you know, bacteria, pollen, and so on, so that we would then be able to relate changes in biodiversity to outcomes and also to features in the home like pets or neighborhood conditions. But that's that's important. The other question is, can microbiota associated with leaf surface produce VOC uptake via metabolic transformation of VOCs? Yes, so there is some indication that not only the microbiota on the surface of the leaf, but they are also um, metabolic enzymes, certain as the aldehyde reductases and uh, the sip of uh, cytochrome P450 enzymes in plants and leaves that can metabolize uh, different types of, uh, of chemicals. Um, we know that green uh, evergreens, which have needles like pine needles, are very good in removing particulate matter, but they stick to these pine needles very efficiently under the leaf surface. So plants can remove both particles as well as gases. Dr. Bhatnagar, I have a question about some of the more sociologic aspects of your project. Um, I wonder if you can tell us just a little bit more about your experience um, sort of with your team kind of going into this neighborhood, what the reception from the residents has been like. Um, uh, have you been welcomed? Has there been any uh, skepticism? And, um, you know, what lessons learned do we have? I'm especially thinking as we might move into other neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah. Um, with even with you know maybe different demographic demographic makeup. Um, mm-hmm. What are what what do we need to know about sort of arriving in these neighborhoods and making changes? Yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. This is the most critical aspect of the project is our community engagement and involvement. We Before we started the project, we did a variety of focus groups in the community and the neighborhood plans. So one of the plans of the neighborhood was to green the neighborhood, I meant more green. This is a neighborhood in South Louisville. It's not very green, it's, it's very diverse. The, uh, we have uh, you know sizable um, white population, a black population, and so, and people of different socioeconomic status. So we went and talked to the neighbors for a long time, actually, I went there knocking door to door, asking people what they thought about the greenness. Some people were very receptive, very happy that we were doing things in the neighborhood, making, trying to make it green. Other people slammed the door in our face and said, get out of here, I don't have time for this nonsense. Right, so, so which is okay. Uh, but most people, when we went there, say, so you want to make this neighborhood greener, we want to plant a tree in your yard, we planted uh, I don't know, over a thousand trees in people's yards. Um, the, the main concern was, uh, what's the catch? Nobody's ever come to the neighborhood and given them something for free. They thought that we are going to plant a tree there and then we would stick them with the bill. So they were a little bit hesitant about that. When we told them, no, 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 we're not going to charge you for anything. Then they were more receptive. That is not to say that there was no opposition. Some people thought that there were greater problems that we should be addressing and spending time and money on, you know, like, um, you know, trying to take care of crime and drug use. This is a very high drug use area. Then we planted trees. And so this is about unintended consequences of working in a community. We planted trees and under the trees, there was a congregation of homeless people. And, and so the neighborhoods came, neighborhood people came to us and said, you know, you're increasing homelessness in this area and people are congregating on the tree and they're using drugs and you're making things worse rather than making things better. And so, so we, you know, but we were not really because we didn't create homelessness or drug use. We just kind of coming into the trees and make it more apparent. So we had to address uh, issues such as that. When we planted the trees and we planted 8,000 trees, now we had the very bad summer, some of the trees died. And, and so then they said, well, you made our neighborhood look ugly. And so we had to quickly remove all the trees and there was all Korea Journal reporters, a big, you know, whatever, um, who were brouhaha over that. But so th- these are some things that we need to work on with the community. But in general, the people who participated in a study, so many people, I would say 500, 600 different people, came for an evaluation that takes about an hour, you have to give blood, you do whatever. They were, they were there, we were in the community uh, all the time for the last three rounds we've been there. And, and so people who are participating in are very, very enthusiastic and they're very, they have very strong proponents. The other people, of course, are there are lots of critiques, a uh, lot of challenges, but that's what even working in the community. But I think there are important lessons learned here. They, now the greater concern of some people is, okay, you put all the trees, you're going to gentrify the area, right? And so how are you going to address that? And are you going to increase or decrease disparities? The frank question answer is we don't know. And, and so we think that there is um, there are more things to be learned and we are going to be there hopefully for the next 20, 30 years to be able to learn. Um, how to work efficiently with the neighborhood and with, with the community and how to then sort of transport this initiative to other places. That's what Natasha is asking, Can we, should we do it beyond Louisville? So I have a lot of interest that have been expressed to me. I've been to many conferences, people, you know, mayors from like Milan and Sydney and, and Bristol um, and Quebec and uh, Dallas and all of them come to me and say, you know, we should do green heart in our neighbor, in our city. Most people don't have the clinical world with all. They can plant the trees, but to do a clinical study that could show an impact of the trees is very, very difficult. I think right now we're talking to people in San Francisco and the Oakland area, maybe they would have sufficient um, sort of clinical resources to be able to do a duplicate, a similar study. We'd love to have it done in another city. Wonderful, thank you. Well, it looks like we've reached um, our nine o'clock hour. So I want to thank everyone for attending and thank you, Dr. Bhatnagar, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, we'll be looking forward to, to seeing some of the results of your study in, in the time to come. Well, thank you for the invitation.